My mother was an agent in Hollywood, a lady agent, a classic 40s career woman. She had short hair and bangs, she wore suits with shoulder pads, and she talked in a gravelly voice. She handled what were known in the business as specialty acts, which is to say mostly midgets. After they stopped making movies like The Wizard of Oz, the midget market dried up and she moved into actors with scars. In the meantime, we had a lot of midgets hanging around the house, and as a result, my father often served food that was a little too bite-sized. My sister Eleanor gets very churlish about my mother's cooking, and she always points out that my mother's fling with rumaki lasted considerably longer than it should have, but Eleanor hates to give credit where credit is due, and the fact is that my mother had enormous flair when she was paying attention, and when she didn't feel like paying attention, she threw in a lot of butter. She could also keep help, which I was raised to believe was no small thing. Indeed, I was raised to believe that almost the worst thing that could be said about you after you grew up was that you couldn't. Every New Year's Day, my parents had a big party, and their friends came over and bet on the Rose Bowl and argued about which of the players on either team was Jewish, and my mother served her famous lox and onions and eggs, which took her the entire first half to make. It took her so long, in fact, that I really don't have time to give you the recipe, because it takes up a lot of space to explain exactly how slowly and painstakingly she did everything, sautéing the onions over a tiny flame so none of them would burn, throwing more and more butter into the pan, cooking the eggs so slowly that my father was always sure they wouldn't be ready until the game was completely over and everyone had gone home. We should have known my mother was crazy years before we did, just because of the maniacal passion she brought to her locks and onions and eggs, but we didn't. Another thing my mother was famous for serving was a big ham along with her casserole of lima beans and pears. A couple of years ago, I was in Los Angeles promoting Uncle Seymour's beef borscht, and a woman said to me at a party, Wasn't your mother B.B. Samstat? And when I said yes, she said, I have her recipe for lima beans and pears. I like to think it would have amused my mother to know that there is someone in Hollywood who remembers her only for her lima beans and pears, but I probably wouldn't have. Anyway, here's how you make it. Take six cups defrosted lima beans, six pears peeled and cut into slices, half a cup molasses, half a cup of chicken stock, half an onion chopped, put it into a heavy casserole, cover and bake 12 hours at 200 degrees. That's the sort of food she loved to serve, something that looked like plain old baked beans and then turned out to have pears up its sleeve. She also made a bouillabaisse with Swiss chard in it. Later on, she got too serious about food. She started making egg rolls from scratch, things like that. And one night, she resigned from the kitchen permanently over a lobster Cantonese that didn't work out. And that was the beginning of the end. Shortly after that, she went into her blue chip stamp phase. She wasn't alone, of course. It was 1963, and there are a lot of American women who were saving blue chip stamps and green stamps and plaid stamps and whatever stamps their supermarkets were giving out. Still, ladies in suits with shoulder pads were supposed to have more sense. My mother, who had spent years avoiding supermarkets, made at least one trip a day to the local thrifty mart. The Scarface market had gone pretty dry on her at this point, and she had very little else to do. She would get into her 1947 Studebaker and set off for a day in the aisles. She developed passionate and brief attachments to new products. One month, she fell in love with Instant Mint Stunnings. Another month, it was Pepperidge Farm Raspberry Turnovers. The next, it was Frozen Chopped Chives. She would return home with her bags of groceries, leave them in the kitchen for the housekeeper to empty, and go up to her bedroom where the card table was equipped with one of those little sponge and jar contraptions you use when you have a lot of stamps to stick. I was living in New York at the time, and I heard about most of this from my sister Eleanor, who was perfecting her sanctimoniousness under the aegis of my mother's progressive insanity. But I saw a little of it firsthand when my mother arrived in Manhattan one day with a 10-speed blender she had purchased for me with 26 books of blue chip stamps. She had carried it onto the plane and held it in her lap all the way to New York. The next day, my apartment was burglarized, and they took the blender complete with warranty. They also took my typewriter, the television set, and my gold bracelet. My mother surveyed the wreckage and then, instead of just going out to buy a new blender for $16, went off to the nearby A&P and spent $600 on groceries just for the plaid stamps. Then she returned to my apartment and began pasting them into stamp books. That's what she was doing when the police finally arrived, sitting there at the table, laughing her gravelly laugh and licking every so often as the two policemen told us what they thought were a lot of rollicking stories about New Yorkers who'd been burglarized of all the presents under their Christmas trees. We all had a drink, and then we all had another, and four hours later, my mother was singing when that midnight choo-choo leaves for Alabama, and the policeman whose lap she was sitting on was taking little nips at her shoulder. Then she got up and did a tap dance to put on the wrist and passed out in the middle of it. It was a fabulous pass out, as those things go. She was in midair when it happened. She had both her legs up to one side, and she just managed to click her heels together when her eyes clanged shut, and she slid on one side of her leg to the floor. I put her to bed. Was I very bad, she said on the way to the airport the next day. Not really, I said. Please say I was, she said. 
My father was a specialty act himself, though not in any formal sense. He was a character actor. He worked under the name Harry Stratton, the same name he still uses, but he played the kind of characters who have no character. He played kindly lawyers and kindly doctors and kindly teachers, and he said kindly things to whatever leading actor was about to lose heart in his fight to discover penicillin or defeat the outlaws or rout the Nazis. He made a lot of money, so did my mother, and they invested it in Tampax stock, and one day they grew rich, and a good thing they were because my mother's medical bills were enormous. She drank and drank and drank, and finally one day her stomach swelled up like a Cranshaw melon, and they took her over to a very fashionable hospital for rich people with cirrhosis, and the doctors clucked and said there was nothing that could be done. My parents had moved to New York by this time, and my mother's hospital room had a view of the East River. She lay there, slowly dying, with my father impatiently standing by. Pull the plug, he would say to the doctors, and the doctors would calmly explain that there was no plug, there was just the wasting away of life. A few of her former clients came to see her. The scar faces frightened the nurses, and the midgets made whoopee on the electric wheelchairs. And now and then she came into focus and made deals. I think we can get you a hundred thou on the next one, she would say. She hadn't handled the client in years, but she went rattling on about points and box office and below the line and above the line. The nurse would bring lunch. I think I'll take it in the commissary, she'd say. One day my father called and said, You'd better come. I think this is it. Of course, he telephoned every day and said that, but it always sounded like wishful thinking. Now, finally, I knew he must be right. I went straight to the hospital, and when I went into her room, she was sleeping. Suddenly, she opened her eyes and looked at me. I just screwed Daryl Zanuck on the remake, she said, and gave a little croak, which I didn't know at the moment was a significant thing, the actual croak. I thought it was just her gravelly laugh, and died. Mother's gone, said the nurse. Not your mother, but mother. I stared at the nurse, stunned, not so much by my mother's death, which after all had been promised for months as far as my father was concerned, was long overdue, but by the nurse's presumption. You can call your mother mother, I snapped, but you can't call my mother mother. The nurse gave me one of those withering looks that are meant to make you feel as if your thoroughly understandable rage is mere female hysteria. She pulled the sheet over my mother's face. We are going to take Mother away now, she said in a tone so condescending that I became even more wild with anger. She's not your mother, I shouted. On top of which, she's not gone, she's dead! Do you hear me? Dead! And what you're going to do is take away her body, so call it a body. Call it a corpse, for Christ's sake! The nurse was now looking at me with an expression of complete horror, which I thought at the time was on account of my behavior, but it wasn't really. It was complete horror at what was happening behind me, which was that my mother had chosen that moment to make a full recovery. The sheet began rising like a slow-motion poltergeist, and then in a burst, my mother whipped off the cloth and shouted, Ta-da! Then she fainted. Fainted dead away, is what the nurse said, which just goes to show you another anomaly of hospital life, which is that they only use the word dead when it doesn't apply. We thought you were dead, I said a few minutes later when my mother came to. I was, she said. I was. She shook her head slightly as if trying to remember a fuzzy dream. I floated away in a white organdy dress and black patent leather Mary Janes, she said. I looked like baby schnooks. I tried to get something to wear that was more dignified, but the dignified clothes were being used on another set. She nodded. It was all coming back now. I looked down, and there was your father, clicking a clapboard that read, Baby's death, take one. The camera started rolling. I was floating further and further away. I was definitely dead. Your father sold the Tampax stock and bought himself a Borsalino hat. Print, he said. It's a wrap. She began tapping her breastbone defiantly. I was the one who sat next to Bernard Baruch at a dinner party in 1944 and heard him say, buy something people use once and throw away. I was the one who stuck a Tampax into my twat in 1948 and came out of the bathroom and said, see if this is traded over the counter. I was the one who made us rich and now the bastard is going off and spending my money on bimbos while I'm stuck in goyish heaven in an inappropriate costume? Fuck this, I said, and at that moment I came back. The next day, when I went to see her, she was sitting up in bed smoking cools and doing the double crossing. I have experienced a miracle, she said. You know what that means, don't you? No, I said. It means there's a God, she said. If you believe in miracles, you have to believe in God. One follows from the other. No, it doesn't, I said. It doesn't follow at all. It doesn't have to be the sort of miracle someone's in charge of. It could have just been an accident of some sort, or a dream, or a misdiagnosis on the part of the nurse. My mother shook her head. I was dead, she said. You should have seen it up there. Fluffy white clouds and little angels with pink cheeks playing tiny harps. Liars, I said. Miss Smart and her college education, said my mother. 
A week later, she checked out of the hospital, filed for divorce, and went to New Mexico to find God. And she did. She found God, and she married him. His name was Mel. He honestly believed he was God. And as my first husband, Charlie, said at the time, if there's one thing we know about God, it's that he's not named Mel. Mel took my mother for every penny she had, plus Charlie's old Swedish modern couch and a set of flatware I was very attached to. Then she died again, this time for good. I would like to ask her what a person who is seven months pregnant is supposed to do when her husband turns out to be in love with someone else. But the truth is, she probably wouldn't have been much help. Even in the old days, my mother was a washout at hardcore mothering. What she was good at were clever remarks that make you feel immensely sophisticated and adult, and if you thought about it at all, foolish for having wanted anything so mundane as some actual nurturing. Had I been able to talk to her at this moment of crisis, she would probably have said something fabulously brittle like, TAKE NOTES! Then she would have gone into the kitchen and toasted almonds. You melt some butter in a frying pan out, whole blanched almonds, and saute until they're golden brown with a few little burned parts. Drain lightly and salt and eat with a nice stiff drink. Men are little boys, she would have said as she lifted her glass. Don't stir or you'll bruise the ice cubes.